So welcome to this keynote, Cultural Appropriation, Compliment or Theft. I'm Claire Fox, I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas. And the whole issue of cultural appropriation is one that we've been looking at actually over the last few years at this festival. We wanted to take, um, it's, you know, it's led to some very fiery debates, I know, but actually at this keynote we wanted to kind of almost take a step back and kind of work out why it's an issue, what we think about it, rather than a kind of for or against uh, in any kind of sense. It's not to stop anyone from the audience saying whatever they want, but I'm just uh, drawing attention to something that we tried to do with the keynotes this year is to actually dig a bit deeper into some of these big issues. You know, there are times when the whole issue around cultural appropriation can feel a little bit like a Daily Mail headline, you know, political correctness gone mad, people kind of reacting against the most egregious examples of it. And there are obviously lots of things which sometimes it can feel too easy to lampoon when celebrities or uh, fashion models are called racist, effectively, for wearing uh, Indian bindis or geisha dresses or the wrong sort of earrings and so on. So, you know, there is a kind of superficial level that this debate can occur, um, but, uh, and, 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 you know, the kind of headlines that you also get that where somebody wrote an article saying why it's not okay for white people to wear dreadlocks and anybody who does is perpetrating white privilege. And so, you know, we all know that kind of side of the arguments in a way, and there's even a lot of rows about food. You know, samosas, kebabs, burritos, tortilla chips. These things have all caused major controversy, particularly on university campuses, about whether they should be served, who's allowed to serve them, and so on and so forth, whether we're culturally appropriating other people's foods. There's even a book that's called A Feminist Guide to Being a Foodie Without Being Culturally Appropriative. It's not on sale at the bookshop here. Um, <laughs> But, you know, having said that, there's a serious issue lurking, so it's not just a kind of joke. An Australian novelist recently made the point, apologised for writing the uh, chant of Jimmy Blacksmith from the point of view of an Aboriginal, and said at a conference organised uh, in Australia called Borrow Voices, uh, Freedom of Expression uh, versus Cultural Appropriation, stressed the importance of permission in cultural exchange and said this, we can enter other cultures as long as we don't loot and plunder, as long as we treat them with cultural respect. And if you actually talk to a lot of people in literary circles, there is a real nervousness now about adopting other voices and whether this is going to be seen as in some way insulting or culturally appropriating the voices of oppressed people. How can you know as a white person what it feels like to be an Aborigine, which obviously to a certain extent could be the end of literature and the uh, end of uh, imagination, but certainly is a challenge. You also have law professor Susan Scafidi from Fordham University in New York, who says that appropriation involves, quote, taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, or artifacts from someone else's culture without permission. And that approach to cultural appropriation has even led to an international campaign for the United Nations to create and in criminal enforcement procedure to prevent, quote, non-consensual taking and illegitimate position, uh, possession, sale and export of traditional cultural expressions and artifacts. So in some ways, cultural appropriation, even though it might look like it's kind of a discussion about how you wear your hair or what dress you wear or, or, or those kind of things, is actually being taken seriously as a major focus for anti-racism and for anti-colonialism uh, amongst serious political people. And I think it's worth exploring whether that's the right thing to do, why it's happened, and what we think about it with some of the uh, nuances uh, that we can bring to the discussion. So we've gathered, I, I hope, a, a really interesting panel of people who in different ways have thought about this issue uh, in, their, in their particular spheres. Um, so to introduce them in the order in which they'll speak, first of all, we've got uh, Dr. Sarah Chang, who is a senior tutor in the history of design at the Royal College of Art, where in fact we used to organise the Battle of Ideas for many years at the Royal College of Art. She's the co-editor of Hair, Styling, Culture and Fashion, and has been looking at the whole research focuses on transnational fashion, material culture and the body from the 19th century to today, with a special interest in the role of Chinese material culture within the histories of Western fashion, and her next book is going to be Xenophilia. So I'm delighted to have Sarah here because I think that 
The fashion world is often invoked as an example of where this is all happening, but again, in a very superficial way. So I thought it was important to bring a, a different element to that. Next, we're going to hear from Samir Rahim, who is the managing editor of Prospect magazine, who I should say are one of the media partners for this festival, particularly associated with this session. And Prospect magazine in a time of serious challenges is a serious read and well worth reading. I think we all need to invest in making sure that we all expose ourselves to some long essays and some thoughtful writing and uh, Prospect is a magazine we're very proud to have involved with the battle of ideas. Samir himself has worked in literary journalism for 10 years, was formerly the arts and books editor at Prospect. And in 2013, his essay, In the Shadow of the Scroll, Reconstructing Islam's Origins, won the William Hazlett Essay Prize. And I think that having a literary editor, I don't know, no idea what he's going to talk about, but I think that because the literature question is so uh, in the centre of this, I thought that was an important voice. Next, we're going to hear from Bijan Omrani, who is a historian and a classicist, has taught classics at a number of schools, like Eton, Westminster, Winchester. He's the author of Caesar's... Yeah, already you've voted against him, and he hasn't said anything yet. He's the author of Caesar's Footprints, Journeys to Roman Gaul. He's the editor of the Asian Affairs Journal. He's a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and the Royal Asiatic Society. And I really wanted to have Bijan's voice here because he's a historian and has thought about the whole historical approach to this and how culture develops historically. Next, we have... Kunli Olulode, who is the director of Voice for Change England, a BME charity and support body that has membership of 360 black and community organisations. He's also the creative director of Reebok Productions that promotes live performance space to a host of British and American artists, including founding the legendary WTF Jam sessions at the Jamboree Club in Barcelona. And he's also a film historian, and he says in his bio that he hates the terms BME and B-A-M-E-R, which uh, he's not alone there. Uh, I can't even pronounce the acronyms, but anyway, I thought it was important to have Cunley here because he's both uh, long-standing uh, involved in anti-racist politics, but also is somebody who worked in the cultural sphere where some of these issues are coming to the fore. And last but not least is uh, Dr. Tiffany Jenkins, who's a writer and broadcaster on cultural policy. She's the author of Keeping Their Marbles, How Treasures of the Past Ended Up in Museums and Why They Should Stay There. You may well have heard her on many Radio 4 programmes. She presented Beauty in the Brain, which was excellent on science and art, and also The Narrative History of Secrecy, which is the basis of her forthcoming book. She's an honorary fellow of the Department of Art History at the University of Edinburgh, and actually spoke on this topic at last year's Battle of Ideas. Sarah, can uh, we hear from you first, please? Okay, thank you. And um, when Claire asked me to come and talk about fashion and cultural appropriation, I immediately envisioned a sort of hail of furious voices coming from the audience because everybody has a very strongly held view about what they should wear and how they, whether or not they can be allowed to wear and who should wear what. Everybody, and this is very, very deeply felt. And actually, it's right that we all have these strongly held views um, and that we have these spaces to debate them. And my own work around fashion and ethnic identity grew out of, I spent about seven years working at London College of Fashion, and I had classes of students um, from all over the world and classes of students from London, many different ethnicities, and everybody was looking for a space to talk about how they felt about what they wore and what that said about their sense of cultural identity, um, and a space that at that point wasn't in the curriculum. Now, I don't work there anymore, so I don't know if that shifted, but at that point it was quite hard to find that space, and a lot of the work I did was about opening up a space for that debate, so I'm really thrilled that this is happening now. Uh, I want to respond to Claire's invitation to dig deeper. Um, which involves, for me, thinking about history and thinking about how fashion works and what fashion actually is. And whether or not cultural appropriation is seen as a problem, I think is really dependent on the power relations at play and obviously where you're positioned in relation to those, those power relations. And so the question that's being put to us here is very much tied in with identity politics, clearly. Uh, I think it's crucial, therefore, to use a little bit of my five minutes to position myself as well. So I'm a design historian. I think a lot about history. I think a lot about how we got here, why are we here today, what happened to create the situation we're dealing with. Uh, I focus in my work on what's broadly called cultural exchange between the West and the East, which in themselves are very contested terms. I think 
if my research has taught me anything, it's that we, we, you know, we live in a situation of utterly, utterly hybrid cultures. There's been centuries and centuries of global flows. And if you just look at textiles, the, the Romans were wearing silk from China. India was a major exporter, exporter of cotton going back centuries and going back, you know, 15th century, 14th century. We have all these global flows that have created the modern world. Uh, you can't get away from that. So if, if history teaches you anything, it's that from materials like cotton, silk, motifs, dye stuffs, where, where, whatever, however you want to look at it, garment shapes, there's a constant mixing, and you have to have an awareness of the transnational complexity of fashion and fashion cultures before you even begin. So the impossibility of isolated cultures, the impossibility of saying this thing belongs to this culture is constantly at issue when you deal with fashion history, if you're willing to look um, it with a more global perspective, if you're willing to think about global histories. Um, in terms of the actual, in terms of a specific example of uh, fashion and ethnic identity, I could point very quickly to the Qi Pao, the Chinese Qi Pao or Chong Sam. And here's a garment that has come to represent China from, you know, during the 20th century, certainly, and I think still now. It, 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 it was a garment that was developed out of a, a mixing of what's broadly called Western fashion and Chinese fashion. So you had, you moved from a garment that was very loose to a garment that was much tighter because it's matching more closely international Western fashion standards. Um, you've also got a garment that's bringing together different ethnic groups within China. So it's a Han Chinese garment and a Manchu Chinese garment brought together. So immediately you've got something that's born of multiple cross-cultural appropriation. And yet it comes to stand for China. Um, why does it come to stand for China? Because you bring in the nation state, you bring in this moment in the 1920s when China as a new republic is trying to establish, you know, what is it to be, what, you know, what should a Chinese woman wear, a modern Chinese woman? Um, and there's a reaching out to a new form of garment that is actually incredibly hybrid. Now, um, I want to position myself, I'm mixed race, I'm half Chinese and half white, half British white. Now, I have a lived experience of being between cultures, so I respond to these questions of theft or compliment in a very complex way, and I actually want to resist strongly the idea that it's theft or compliment because of my own lived experience. You know, what determines, you know, what it, what's right for me to eat or wear or so on, what's mine, is, is a constant question for me. What do I have a sense of authority over? And I'm not alone. I know that I'm not alone in, have, in, in experiencing that sense, whether or not you're dealing with diasporic identity or mixed heritage identity. I'm working all the time with trying to understand how fashion relates to ethnic identities, given the strong sense of identity that fashion produces. And you have to listen to all the strong emotions that people have. People are passionate about their cultural symbols. Just to assert that they shouldn't be isn't going to get you anywhere. Also, to tell people that they haven't got the freedom to dress as they want isn't going to get you anywhere. Uh, I think about the Chi Pao. Um, I think about my grandmother. My grandmother in the 1960s wore the Chi Pao all the time. Uh, but she was living in Hong Kong at that moment. Uh, it, was, it was her daily dress. I think of all the black and white photographs of her in her Chi Pao. And so, thank you. When I, um, when I think about, when I see celebrities, white celebrities, Americans, whatever, wearing the Chi Pao, I, my response is, why are you wearing my grandmother's dress? Now, that's a very personal response, but it speaks to, you know, it tells us something about why our responses to cultural appropriation are so deeply felt and so emotional. It doesn't tell us much about what Chinese people in general think, because we've got, we've got to deal with lots of different registers of identity formation. Um, I'm going to move very quickly just to say briefly about why it is fashion as a thing so easily causes offence. Okay, so first of all, fashion works in a way that detaches meaning from objects. The constant borrowing is partly a, a constant restless search for innovation, right, and exoticism and newness. Um, and the constant turnover, the ephemerality of fashion encourages people to detach from meaning. That we, we just, it's constant turnover and we're going to project our own meanings. The way in which fashion is designed, the tools that fashion designers are given, such as the mood board, also encourage us to let go of meaning. You're just going to pluck all these different, cut out culture, stick it all together, create something new. And the problem also with that is it encourages the design 
designer to believe that they hold the creativity and it encourages the designer to not give credit to the originating cultures or, um, or even to acknowledge that those originating cultures exist. Uh, so the creativity starts to be held by the designer, not by the originating culture. That's another level on which that happens. And lastly, as consumers, we're encouraged to think that we mix and match, create ourselves daily through what we wear, and the idea that that's not um, our right to do is um, incredibly contentious. OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, Sarah, that was really interesting and uh, certainly kind of brought some real sort of depth, exactly what I wanted to, uh, sort of thinking about fashion and, and where it sits in relation to this discussion. But you brought a lot more as well, so great, thank you. Um, Samir, your thoughts? Not so long ago, I was in Jordan, in Amman, and I was invited to a wedding there. And I was very keen to go because I wanted to see what a Jordanian wedding was like. Um, would they be doing sword dances like they kind of do in the Gulf? Or would they be doing dub care music there, perhaps, like they do in the Levant? What kind of authentic cultural experience could I get? So like a typical British person, I went over there expecting um, great authenticity from uh, the experience. Um, and so after the, the um, ceremony was over, um, the music came on. And what came on was a man playing the bagpipes. And I was a little bit surprised by this. He was wearing a cafe with a sort of headdress, but he was playing you know, proper Scottish bagpipes. And he was playing some vaguely Scottish sounding tunes. And then he started playing tunes, which I then discovered were Jordanian pop music refashioned through this. So this was a bizarre experience for me. And then I asked, I asked someone there, I said, so is this just this family? I mean, uh, and, and, and the reply I was given was, no. Uh, bagpipes are everywhere in Jordan. Every wedding has bagpipes, obviously. Uh, and I tried to work out why this might be. So, um, you know, Jordan is a sort of essentially a British colonial creation as a country. Until the 1970s, the head of the army in Jordan was British, a guy called Glub Pasha, as he was nicknamed. The king at the moment, you know, he went to Sandhurst. There's a very strong culture of the British Imperial Army culture, which had obviously disseminated into Jordan um, uh, in a particularly uh, interesting way. Then a few months later, I got reading an article in Prospect magazine by Neil Asherson, who is a Scottish writer. And he was being asked by a friend of his, I think an, a Hungarian friend, why are the royal family so obsessed with Scottish stuff? It's like, why, why is there always Highland stuff there? Why do they have bag, you know? And, and he, the answer, of course, is that after um, you know, the defeat of the Jacobites in the 18th century, Scottish cultural traditions were, in a way, appropriated by the British army, absorbed into them, and in a sense, made their own. So you've got this curious thing where you've got the sort of imperial power of the English-British taking over uh, and defeating the Scottish rebellion, and then sort of taking and absorbing its culture. Of course, the bagpipes have even got an even longer history than that. And in fact, there are theories that you know, it, they came to England before they even came to Scotland. So bagpipes are mentioned in Chaucer, for instance, whilst I think the first bagpipes mentioned in Scottish tradition uh, is later. And then I was looking up that there are actually um, uh, um, <coughs> Romanesque churches which have bagpipe players in the 11th century and the 12th century, and all the way back, you know, uh, Egyptian origins, possibly. Um, so maybe it all comes full circle and it's just sort of back to the, back to the Middle East. But what this example, seemingly flippant, um, uh, can teach us, I think, is two things. One, that the idea that there is such a thing as an authentic cultural object which belongs to you and you only is kind of a myth. It might be a myth that's important to you and that has its own power, but it is a myth. And the second one, and here I sort of have maybe a little bit more sympathy with the people who point out what they describe as cultural appropriation, is that um, cultural objects are often inflected by uh, uh, imperial processes. Um, it is the case that you have an object which moves and has been facilitated by the British Empire. So for people in Jordan, bagpipes have an association with sort of high authoritative um, um, classiness, if you were, because they are 
essentially you know, part of the Britain and the British army. And that is to do with the complex colonial relationship between Britain and Jordan. And then, of course, you've got the reason why the bagpipes are there in the first place in the British army, because of the relationship between England uh, and Scotland. So for me, it's not really an argument about whether cultural appropriation is right or wrong. It's, it's more about what can we do uh, when we look at cultural objects, how can we analyze them in such a way that takes account of their multiplicity and their complexity, um, but that also has to take account of power imbalances between the people who are maybe creating the objects and who are using the objects as well. Okay, Thank you. There are lots of vivid images there and um, uh, very thought-provoking. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Bijan, your thoughts, please. Thank you very much. One of the first problems with calling cultural appropriation theft is that it is in itself an act of cultural appropriation. Uh, the term theft belongs to the criminal law and we're using it in a debate about culture. However, given the precision with which the criminal law operates, I think it's good to press the analogy home as an instrument to discover why, at least in my view, cultural appropriation should be seen as a boon and that we shouldn't see it or treat it with the opprobrium that belongs to a crime. In English law, theft has five elements. You have to appropriate property belonging to another, dishonestly with an intention to permanently deprive. And I want to look at a few of those headings in the context of the idea of cultural appropriation. Firstly, the idea of property. Well, if you have the idea of property, you have to have the idea of ownership. And we have to think very carefully about in whose hands the ownership of culture rests. If we point to a certain cultural community, for want of a better term, does the mandate to allow people outside that community to use the motifs and ideas of that culture belong to a hierarchy of the community or the individuals of the community? If it's a hierarchy of that community, then it's one thing for the hierarchy to tell the intrinsic community that the culture must be used in a certain way and it cannot be referenced, changed, parodied, made the object of satire or disposed. But to me, it seems a chilling notion that some authority in another community should try to tell and bind anyone elsewhere in the world not to use any ideas which emerge anywhere. It seems to me something which is chilling of the potential for cultural creativity. Or is it an individual from the culture who has the right to do so? What if individuals disagree? Should they hold a referendum? That terror aside, who is, in fact, a member of a cultural community? I come to my own example. My father is from Iran. My mother is English. Does that give me mandate enough to allow the reuse of cultural ideas from Iran in uh, things that should be created in an English artistic context? Or does it actually mean I shouldn't ever teach classics at an English public school because I'm not English enough to do so? Where do the limits lie? And even if I were Iranian enough to allow the reuse of Iranian ideas, well, actually, I'm not Iranian enough on the other side because actually we come from a Kurdish background in the Northwest. My father's family is Jewish. My mother's family is English atheist. Does that mean I can't sort of give vent to my great love for choral, even song and incense? Is that to be denied me? There is another idea as well, and the idea of the delimitation of cultures, temporally and spatially. If I am Persian enough to allow the reuse of, or to mandate the reuse of Persian cultures, is it just contemporary Persian culture? Or can I mandate the reuse of 19th century ideas from the Qajar dynasty, or 16th century ideas from the Saf uh, Safavid dynasty, or the Ilkhanids, or the Parthians, or the Achaemenids? back to the 5th century BC. And of course, the Persian Empire was always in flux. At its greatest extent, it stretched to Egypt in the west and the banks of the River Indus in the east. Does a Persian of today therefore have the mandates to pick anything from those areas and mandate it to be reused? Where is the boundary of the culture? 
And just to throw into that mix the memory that at certain times, Persia was oppressed either by Arab invaders or Afghans, just as a couple of examples, or Russians. And at other times, it was an oppressive state, say, against the Georgians or the Arabs. Where does oppression come into the whole calculus as to which culture can interact with each other? Another heading from theft, belonging to another. We're told, for example, that we cannot reference um, the cultural initiation ceremonies of Lakota tribes in uh, America or native Australian artistic motifs or ceremonies because the spiritual approaches and the spiritual experience belong exclusively to those people. But what if those ceremonies, what if those motifs should actually prompt within me or in any other artist anywhere in the world a new access, a new idea, a new approach to the spiritual? Does it really have to belong only to one? Surely this is a universal thing. Samir's so talked about the universality of many ideas. And again, do these ideas really belong to another person or do they belong to humanity? One final idea, the intention to permanently deprive. Is there a deprivation? Yes, I would say there is a deprivation, but it's a deprivation of power from hierarchies in the favor of the individuals who want to be individually creative. If anything, cultural appropriation has been the salvation of cultures. I give one example, ancient Greek culture. The poetry and the mythology was appropriated by Romans, and from it we have the whole foundation of the Western European canon of literature. The ideas of philosophy and theology were appropriated by the Christian church and the Islamic world as well to found a, a, a theological and, and intellectual basis for those religions. And also artistically, one example, the image of the Buddha, where does that come from? It is from uh, artists and statues from central Afghanistan, where Greek colonists were settled by Alexander the Great, mixing with Indian cultural ideas. Are we to deny that to happen? One idea from the Greeks, Heraclitus said that all things are in flux. Culture must be in flux always. It is granular and individual. And the notion of cultural appropriation is deeply conservative. It stands in the way of the individual creativity and the development of culture. Thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very rich presentation. Thank you very much, Bijan. Uh, Conley. Okay, first off, I have to confess I come from a family of serial cultural appropriators. <laughs> I know this because on my mother's uh, mantelpiece in our living room is a picture of her in Lagos in 1952 wearing a sari. <laughs> her nickname was Cosmopol, short for Cosmopolitan. Uh, and very much I identify with the world of Sarah in terms of fashion. Um, she was a dressmaker who traveled from Nigeria to train at what is now called the London College of Fashion. Uh, it was called something else uh, back in the 1950s. Um, but she brought with her uh, an idea of experimentation, of diversity in thought, and uh, a willingness to challenge uh, the environment in which she was brought up in um, to reach um, out uh, for bigger ideas. However, uh, it's kind of strange that we're having this discussion today uh, at a time when the level of technology, very different from the 1950s, has given us the opportunity and scope um, to diversify our ideas and thinking uh, over a much wider range of issues uh, in terms of design, in terms of music, in terms of politics, in terms of just thinking that we should be having a, a discussion about actually how we limit ourselves. So from my own standpoint, as an offspring of a Nigerian family brought up in the UK, who's worked in the arts industry, primarily in music uh, and performance arts, uh, who now works uh, out of uh, also London and Barcelona, I have actually Spanish residency, probably soon to become Catalan. And for me, uh, that richness in terms of uh, diversity um, is very important. However, I think we would be naive to assume that the notions of cultural appropriation don't have some wider resonance uh, in society. 
Uh, in 2001, um, I, along with Bumi Popola, uh, a playwright, decided to put on a production of uh, Wally Shoyinka's uh, The Lion and the Jewel at the Bloomsbury Theatre. Um, we decided to do this uh, with an all-white cast. Uh, that's white people playing Africans, in case you're not following. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of it wasn't about that kind of twist to it, but it was, in effect, uh, an attempt to get a wider recognition around Shoyinka's written work in the uh, English literary canon to a wider audience. But what was interesting for us was putting that play on and seeing it in front of a mixed audience and their reaction, uh, particularly the, the uh, audience of black people that attended the, the, the presentation of it. Um, I can tell you the, the opening night, there were almost fights after the first um, session. Um, because that notion of uh, white people being set in an African village wearing uh, African attire uh, in some ways was too far out of people's ability to actually appreciate the art form. Um, and we had underestimated, I think, um, the reaction. Um, certainly for people from the Caribbean and from North America, um, they expressed, um, you know, in, in very stark terms, their views on what we were attempting to do. Other people, particularly Africans, actually were nonplussed about it and thought it was an interesting experiment. But it was, for me, the first kind of insight into um, notions of cultural appropriations and the limitations that um, artistic practice has in terms of being able to open up that discourse. Um, and likewise, I think the, the question of um, how um, art, uh, particularly uh, in relation to music, has been discussed uh, within um, uh, artistic circles, going back at, probably before the discourse around cultural uh, appropriation, is something that's still quite sharp. Uh, and in the music industry, it's probably the sharpest of all. Uh, the discussions around go back to you know, the emergence of Elvis Presley and his incorporation of black music styles into his um, act and his ability to transcend um, both the, the local area in which he came from to become a major superstar and multimillionaire has uh, been a discussion within the music industry I know has gone on for years and years and still even with the emergence of contemporary artists like Amy Winehouse, the discussion amongst black artists about why it is that uh, they are not able to actually come through and achieve the same levels of attention and material rewards is a serious issue. So the question of cultural appropriation is not just one of aesthetics. There is a material basis to it, which also affords us an insight into a wider question of social control. Who controls what? Who owns what? Those are questions which, um, despite our kind of liberal consensus on the panel, still, I don't think, are addressed seriously enough. Um, and certainly, uh, to just take a contemporary example, um, Chuck Berry um, and the whole issue of the release of the record um, uh, Surfing USA by the Beach Boys, which borrows directly uh, from his own music. Um, from 1963 to 1966 was listed, the composer was Brian Wilson. Um, that issue went to court um, and was not resolved until um, 2002, when finally both the royalties and the acknowledgement of uh, where the music and the authorship of that record was determined. So the question of legality uh, is also a component within this, and I think also um, injects, I think, something into discussion around what we define as appropriation. It's not just um, an, an aesthetical uh, question. Um, but I think, uh, finally, I just make a point. Um, as we go forward with the developments around the internet and the fragmentation of copyright, um, there is a discussion, another discussion to be held, I think, about ownership. And I do think that the, the, the material issues around this, um, we have technology which is probably running a, ahead of where we're at socially. And I think in terms of those uh, sections of society that have the power to control um, copyright and those that don't, there are some burning issues that I think still need to be resolved. Okay, thank that. you.
thanks, Connie. That was uh, fascinating, and uh, there's raised lots of issues that I, I hope we'll have time to pursue. Um, but for now, uh, finally, Tiff. Thanks. I, I too want to start from the premise that cultural appropriation is integral to the arts, and actually also being human, that culture is communally forged, it's ever-changing, and we all want to uh, free ourselves from the claustrophobic kind of lives that we had um, and have by talking to each other and reaching beyond our own experiences, and art helps us to do that. It, we can travel through time and place by it. So to answer the question, um, why now has cultural appropriation been so furious and in many ways so successful, I want to look at a particular case and try and unpick it. Um, that case is um, a piece of art by an artist called Sam Durant. The piece of art is called Scaffold, and it went on show in the Walker Art Gallery in Minneapolis in June of this year. It is now no longer on show. It's been dismantled. It could have been burnt, but it will probably be buried. So what is the piece of work? It's, um, as the name suggests, Scaffold. It's about seven historical incidences of state-sponsored executions between about 1850 and 2006. One of those seven is when Saddam Hussein was killed in 2006. One of them was the execution of the Lincoln conspirators, those people that were involved in the execution of Lincoln, including the first woman to be killed by the US state. Another was of a case when 38 Dakota Native American men were killed in around 1860. There are others as well, but you get the point. These are seven historical incidences of when the US killed or were involved in executing people. The reason why the controversy exploded wasn't, as you might expect, because about state executions. It could well have been this year about 21 people have been executed by the US by lethal injection. Um, so it would be quite opposite that we would be angry and uh, protesting about state execution, execution. Instead, the South Dakota tribe protested that because Sam Durant is white, he had no right to represent their history. And you've seen this refrain on a number of occasions, including Exhibit B that was due to be on show at the Barbican in 2004, um, the argument that you do not have the right to represent the past and the pain if you have not experienced it. So how did this happen? Um, I think Kunli looked a little bit at the kind of bottom-up feelings um, and how this kind of does key into something that people are experiencing and feeling, a kind of sense of victimhood, a kind of sense that they have been ignored for too long and that they are powerless. I want to look at it from a kind of more top-down approach because I think this is something that arts institutions themselves have been involved in fanning and flaming. Um, they have sort of been riding a number of social trends. And in a way, I hate the phrase, they're asking for it. But in a way, if that's one thing I want you to sort of take away, is I think there's an element of that involved here. So to give you an example of what I mean, in 2004, uh, the federal government in America funded, to great expense, an institution called the Museum of the Native American. In many ways, it was a long time in coming. Native American culture, obviously integral to America. It had <coughs> had a life of its own. It had kind of existed in a number of different forms, the artifacts after they were collected in the turn of the century. But they didn't have a big institution dedicated as uh, they do now, which is on the mall in Washington. It's a really big deal, about time two, you might say. But that institution was very different to previous institutions, previous museums set up. Number one, only certain people can curate and see what's on there, and that is on the basis of their ethnicity. So you have to be Native American, you have to be of a particular tribe, which is federally mandated. Um, you may have to be a man rather than a woman. Um, it's almost as if it's a non-federally funded public institution. Why do they do this? They do this with intentions that sound honorable and admirable. One is to redress past wrongs to make apology, to, um, to undo the wrong that was done to Native Americans. But what they have done is that they've done it through culture 
rather than politics, rather than kind of material deprivation or inequality. They've turned to artifacts to do this for them. Now, culture can be political, but it cannot be directly political in that way. And in so doing, they politicized those artifacts and turned them really into objects of apology that only certain people can see. I think they have fanned the flames by inviting certain groups in, privileging certain groups on the basis of their ethnicity, and basically telling them that they have a right to veto. Now, when I say certain groups, you have to ask who? Who speaks for the Native Americans? And who decides? Well, ultimately, it's still the federal government, it's still museums, and it's often you know, sharp elbowed urban activists. Uh, does anybody really speak for a culture? Um, in the way that they are now being given permission to. Now, what happened with the Walker is a very similar process, if you ask me. They apologized immediately. They said, sorry, we were presumptuous to imagine that we could put on an exhibition by this guy, Sam Durant, about, about the, the state execution. They apologized. Sam Durant has basically given over his intellectual property to these small group of people I think they have been complicit in it. It, of course, does not challenge state power. It creates people and puts them into boxes on the basis of ethnicity. And ultimately, it leaves us silent because it effectively says, you cannot speak for somebody else's culture unless you're of the right ethnicity. So it could leave us as silent as those that hang from the noose, which is why it's a problem. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, thank, uh, thanks, Tiff. Kunli's uh, speech um, reminded me, but um, I, I, because I used this story recently, which my, my mum and dad, we had some next door neighbours in North Wales where I grew up, and an Indian couple, a young Indian couple, which was quite unusual in those days um, to have uh, um, an Indian uh, neighbour. And the, in, the young Indian couple were. Uh, subject to some racism. It's, you know, typical story of the uh, good old English uh, 70s. And my mum and dad, maybe because they were Irish, um, kind of became very friendly with them, kind of took them under their wing, they were a bit younger, and invited them to St. Patrick's Night do. And there was kind of great sort of excitement that the kind of Indian uh, 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 neighbours were kind of, you know, they wore their shamrock and they, and they kind of drank the Guinness and it was kind of all good fun. And as a consequence of which, the uh, next door neighbours bought my mum a, a beautiful sari as a present and then took them out to a, a dinner dance, as they used to go to in those days, a dinner dance. And there's photos of my mum in this beautiful sari given to her as an act of solidarity and thanks, really, for, for her contribution and so on and so forth. So anyway, I, I tell you this because I told this story recently and, and, and somebody said, yes, but I mean, should she really warn it? <laughs> and I was so gobsmacked. I mean, I genuinely thought... I, I, and I said, well, what would she, I mean, would she have said no, right? And then I said, well, should they have worn the shamrock? And people said, well, and I thought, oh, I'm losing it. <laughs> so the reason I'm saying that is because this debate has become quite toxic as well. So I would appeal to you in the audience, uh, and, and people assume to have the worst kind of malign motives. That was what I was going to say. And in that instance, a white Irish woman wearing a sari was as an act of friendship for not being an anti-racist, she never have thought of herself like that, but for being kind, if you see what I mean, um, and sticking up for somebody in a very unpopular way. She was unpopular, my mother, for wearing that sorry and for befriending the Indians. So at least in this discussion, I just want to appeal to a bit of good faith um, because what we, we will all disagree, I think. Uh, lots of disagreements will occur, but, but I think if we can try and attribute generously why people do certain things on both sides of the argument, um, that would be helpful at untangling this. So um, let, I'm going to go straight out to the audience, and then I'm actually just going to come back and take, grab the panel uh, quite a bit. So, Hey there. So I wanted to ask a question about the kind of nature of what constitutes permission, I guess, and very quickly put it in the context of a personal story. So um, I have a Nigerian flatmate, and he gave me something called dashiki, which is this kind of gorgeous West African, very colourful garment. And uh, he gave it to me with the words, now you're Nigerian too. Um, so anyway, I put it on uh, the next day and I wore it out and uh, I was very quickly cornered and uh, told that I was culturally appropriating something without permission. And I have a lot of sympathy with the concept of uh, cultural appropriation, but I guess what my question is, is what constitutes permission? 
and is it possible to get it? And if so, where can I get it? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Okay, so my question is about history. So one of the things that wasn't really addressed in this panel is part of the, the cultural appropriation outrage is based on historical precedent, right? So let's take the example of Kendall Jenner, right? Who did her hair in dreadlocks and people were outraged because they said, well, black people weren't allowed to do their own hair in dreadlocks. Why is it now that one celebrity has done it that you know, this celebrity can now do it. And I think it's great to talk about cultural appropriation in the modern context, but my question for the panel is, how do we overcompensate for the history of cultures being denied their ability to show their culture? And how do we reconcile that with the ability of everyone being able to wear what they want? I agree with the panel, um, uh, but there seemed to be a bit of consensus, and that's what I want to kind of ask you maybe to uh, step up a little bit more. I don't think anybody on the panel um, is against cultural appropriation. I think everybody, um, uh, there was consensus there, and I think um, everybody's explanation really revolved around arguing that cultural is universal, and any attempt to make it particular is either untenable, doesn't work, uh, or inappropriate. Um, culture is fluid and all the rest of it. Um, I agree with the panel. Um, however, I don't know whether as a, I'm not saying that's what you're doing, but as a strategy to combat um, uh, the argument and the offence and the passion and the upset that people experience, what you said does a good job. So my question is, how do you combat in a conversation or in a situation where someone says to you, I think it's outrageous that you are wearing that Indian headdress, that you are wearing that Nigerian um, uh, costume. Uh, if I responded to that by trying to explain to them that culture is actually universal and they're being very particular, it just doesn't seem to cut it because immediately you get drawn into this conversation when it comes up, it is full. As Kunli's uh, example I think was very good, uh, indicating that it's full of passion and anger and real upset because, of course, the people who are pursuing it feel themselves to be an oppressed, um, vulnerable, put-upon minority, and they're standing up for themselves against more powerful sections of society. So do you have any advice, uh, 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 if I was so uh, kindly given a Nigerian uh, national costume, what I should say uh, if I was walking down the street and asked to uh, uh, remove it? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I don't like white people with dreadlocks, but that's mostly because it reminds me of some extremely poor fashion choices I made when I was 14. Um, there are these kind of, there are, there are certain moments when cultural appropriation seems to be not just okay but cool. And I was interested in the, the panel's kind of take on why we fixate on some art forms in different ways to others. So, for example, I sometimes wear a skirt and people say to me, oh, how cool, how progressive. Yeah. You're such a feminist, how androgynous. I'm clearly appropriating what is very much a woman's garment for now, although maybe not in the near future, and yet somehow I'm sort of slapped Unless on the back and told I'm great. Yeah. And the other example is architecture. If I went to a, a completely different climate, different country, and I built in a style that had nothing to do with the local vernacular and made no reference to uh, traditional styles there, I'd be called a colonial. Um, so it seems like, at least in the case of architecture, cultural appropriation is kind of enforced. And so I, I'm wondering if, if there's any kind of clue as to why we look at fashion particularly and food and music, but kind of have a completely inverted relationship when it comes to gender or architecture. So um, how do you compensate for history, um, was asked. Um, you can do it by more art and more free speech. So I'll take a very specific example, uh, Rudyard Kipling's Kim. Now, that novel, I mean, Kipling is a friend of Cecil Rhodes, so I'm sort of waiting for him to get... Um, criticised, but that novel has inspired a number of Indian writers to write novels, The English Patient, The Impressionist, many others, um, uh, some, some out of genuine inspiration, others out of, uh, of resistance, plus you've got academics and critics who've, who've responded sensitively to the way uh, that Kipling depicted India in that novel. Um, so what you end up with is a, a very rich, broad discussion about the representation of, of people at that time. Um, so you, you don't need to, to stop reading it or stop studying it. W what it leads to is more art, more, more um, discussion, and that can only be a good thing. Um, and the last point on that, um, I wish I'd read it before I voted Remain, to be honest, because actually that novel, what it shows you, um, is an India in which um, you've got these hidden administrators who are undemocratically elected, kind of behind the scenes. You, they, uh, most Indians never actually see them. 
but there they are, kind of working away, keeping people in check, collecting taxes. <coughs> so actually, it's very prescient now. So that, that would be what I'd say to that. For me, in most cases, I remain slightly ambivalent about the idea of cultural appropriation, and in many cases against it. However, uh, to tease out perhaps the idea from Zygmunt Bauman, the allegorical figure of the stranger, the stranger is seen as being the other, full of um, threatening qualities. However, the, the stranger at the same time is seen as having qualities which are alluring and exciting. And for a dominant, if you look at the political and, and power structure, for the dominant culture, it is the, the other, this allegorical figure, whose artifacts are, are the exciting ones because they're defined and, and uh, um, sanitized effectively and made more palatable to the general culture in society. So to go back to that gentleman's comment about the economical coordinates of, of the arguments of cultural appropriation, for me that's what's particularly interesting because cultural appropriation sometimes is devoid of a true appreciation of the other and a humanizing of the other. So for example, flamenco, um, something which is seen as um, a cultural production of, let's say, gypsies, but a, a, a particular authentic gypsy cannot sell in the same way as perhaps maybe a sanitized small town in Andalusia can do. It, it's that sanitization and that allegorical figure which intrigues me. Okay, I want to start by clarifying that it's not that I'm for cultural appropriation. I think that, um, well, I think that cultural appropriation and therefore cultural ownership is not an absolute thing. And that where there is definitely cultural ownership and you believe in cultural ownership, then I think cultural appropriation is theft and is wrong. But I wouldn't say that I definitely believe in the idea of cultural appropriation or not cultural appropriation, Do you, if you see what I mean. Um, I want to speak directly to the question of history and historical precedent, because I think it's a really good question. And also, you know, how do you combat offence? Uh, well... You can't fix history, clearly, but you, you can stop repeating it. So if you, if you, if you recognise that, that wrong was done in a period of history, and if you recognise the claims of a certain cultural group, then don't repeat it symbolically. For the good example is the wearing of the feathered headdresses at festivals. Um, if you recognise that Native nations and, and Native Americans have a right to say don't wear that, it's disrespecting our culture, then don't wear it at a festival. Or, if you don't recognise Native people's claims to those headdresses as important to their, you know, their sense of cultural integrity, and if you don't recognise the harm that's done to them and is still done to them, then go ahead and wear the headdress, but expect to be criticised, expect to give deep offence, expect to have to constantly um, justify yourself, um, and I won't agree with what you're doing personally, but you know, so it's like if you choose that hat, wear it and understand that you're going to offend. Um, because dress is highly symbolic. Dress is not about warmth, and well, it is about warmth and protection, but its primary function is actually about communicating. But can, I just, where you can, are. I, can I just ask you, just, just, just for the purposes of clarity, mm. I mean, in terms of the permission, because when you sort of say, if the Native American community say wearing that headdress will offend. I mean, it's like, it's not all of them. I mean, that's, mm. that was the question about the permission, right? Yeah. So, so how do you decide which ones to listen to? Because Tiff used the example of the museum in, in Washington. There's a particular group of activists who say this museum can only be looked at and curated and so on, but not every Native American mm. Uh, in, uh, in America goes along with that. I mean, is that, are they elected? I mean, you know, you know what yeah. I'm saying? How does yeah. that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, yeah, I mean, I think everybody has to make a decision about what authority they want to recognise. Uh, okay. I mean, I don't know that particular example, so I can't yeah, really yeah. comment on it. But. Okay, fine. Uh, Conley, anything you want to pick up? In terms of permissions, I think this is complex um, in that people tend to have a very static view of culture. The culture doesn't operate like that. So when we look at something like fashion um, and the African attire, um, the role uh, of uh, colonial, colonialism, as was indicated by my friend on the panel, is very important. So kente cloth and African cloth manufacture, most of what you see in Africa does not come from Africa. It's actually manufactured in Holland. Um, and you from the fashion industry would know that. Um, not many people are aware of that, but it's been manufactured in Holland for over 150 years. So you wanna, what is the cultural specifics of that? Um, it's actually an illusion. 
Uh, somebody talked about uh, the bagpipes. We could talk about the Scottish kilt invented by an English tailor. Uh, a kilt is actually something that you wear over your shoulder and wrap around your body. It's not a miniskirt. <laughs> you know? um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that to actually pinpoint and define a, a particular cultural ownership is very difficult to do. Uh, and I could come up with probably another 10 examples uh, in relation to that. So in terms of the, uh, my friend over here talking about the sanitization of culture, I would argue actually the manufacture of African prints in Holland has actually improved both the, the quality of the uh, textile and the design. And in fact, some of the designs now coming out of Africa in response to what's come out of Europe is amazing. Uh, and I'm a keen follower <coughs> of, of this stuff. So I don't see it as um, uh, sanitization. I see it as growth. I see it as development. And I see it uh, as something that's really exciting. I could just pick up, somebody mentioned um, Kipling's Kim. I mean, that's an, an amazing novel. Um, I think when he was growing up, Kipling spoke Hindu, Hindustani as a, as a boy until he was four or five years old. And then he lost that when he was sent to um, school in England. And in a way, that novel is about his um, attempt to recreate or reclaim his own childhood experience, but somehow not being able to ultimately by the end of the novel because the British Empire was this big thing that meant that he could never, he could never really sort of recreate it. I think when people are, somebody mentioned sensitivity or people, when people are seen to be sensitive or oversensitive even uh, about things, my first question is um, not to try and silence them or make them um, feel as if uh, they don't have a right to speak. It's to try to ask them and try, to try and work out why that might be the case. Because it's very possible that they're pinpointing something that you haven't recognized about a particular text. Um, so in the issue of literature, you talk, talk about characters who you're writing about who are not of your own culture. About 10 or 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I think, the Egyptian novelist Ala Al Aswani wrote a book called Chicago. He said the whole book in Chicago, it was written in Arabic, then translated into English. And he had characters who were Arab, and he also had characters who were American. And I reviewed this novel, and I thought, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a particularly great novel. But I was interested to, to see that um, Michael Gove, who is uh, in his former incarnation as a sort of cultural critic, remember he used to sort of appear on TV and opine about this and that and the other. He reviewed this book, I think, on a Newsnight review. And he said that um, he was very upset that, uh, you know, that the, 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 the American character, the white American characters were portrayed in very stereotypical ways. And um, it was, you know, really not an accurate portrayal of what those people were like. And the author clearly didn't know America very well. And you could feel, you know, this is, you know, snowflake Michael Gove. You know, he's just <laughs> such a, where, where the sensitivity? And then he said, oh, but the Arab characters, flawless. You know, absolutely. I mean, he's on the button. He really understands how they tick. Now, the thing is, that novel is full of stereotypes. That novel, the Arab characters are as stereotyped as the, as the American ones. What we're talking about is an aesthetic judgment. There are no rules about this as such. But what there is is an author has to recognize um, the weight of the words, or an artist has to recognize the weight of the images that they're using. They have power. That's why you use them. And um, in a way, sensitivity in its broadest sense, sensitivity to other people, sensitivity to language, sensitivity to the historical weight a particular word has, or a particular item of clothing has, or a particular painting style has, is what you ask of any artist. Often when people are objecting strongly to something that is um, culturally appropriating, sometimes I think they might really be saying, that's just a bad work of art. I think, I think that's, that's really valid. I just wanted to add something to it. I mean, I, I think I, when I was reading that quote out earlier, I didn't say it was Thomas Keneally, but anyway. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of angst in literary circles about this, but one, one, one of the things that has happened, which is disconcerting, is the, the two literary editors who've been sacked in Canada. In the first instance, for, publishing, for writing and publishing in a collection of essays in relation to cultural appropriation, he wrote a piece saying cultural appropriation will kill literature. I mean, he said it much more articulately than that. And he actually got sacked for writing that article. And the second literary editor got sacked for tweeting his abhorrence at the fact that the first one got sacked. 
And it was, and, and the reason I'm mentioning that is because that's what I mean about it becoming toxic, because rather than it being that we can learn something and listen and think and work out what we think, and there might be something in some of the points that are made, and maybe actually um, you, you could do with kind of get, getting better art that would get inside uh, uh, both the characters and the particulars of their culture or what have you. That isn't what's happening. So I just wondered if you had any reflections on that at all or any thoughts. Yes, I mean, as you know, I work as an editor uh, at a magazine and a lot of the things we do is, I do, is have to make choices about what you put in the magazine and who you select um, to write. And often when you think about who might be able to review this book, you think, um, who might know something about this subject? Who might... Um, have a sort of sense of knowledge or sensitivity to it. Um, often that can lead to sort of very obvious and banal um, uh, commissioning where you just sort of, oh, that person is from X background, therefore send them that book. And that sometimes um, doesn't work very well. Um, we are always selecting, though. We are always excluding various things and including others. And although one would like to think that of course, I would just, I'm just using my own judgment here, and I'm uninflected by all the kind of prejudices and background that I have. I think it's important just to be aware that um, if you do have even a small bit of sort of cultural power or decision-making power, that um, you um, think about what you are choosing and why you might be choosing it. Um, obviously, um, you know, a case in which somebody is sacked or got rid of because they've written a particular article. Yeah, and that's publicized very broadly, and we can all sort of talk about free speech, but a thousand decisions are made every day to not recommission someone or not do that book or not review that exhibition. So these things are, you know, not publicized as much, perhaps, but it's always a selective process. Okay, thanks. Uh, BJ. I'll try to bring together a couple of questions here. I mean, the question of compensation for the past and the question of trousers, which I found very interesting. Um, when Alexander the Great invaded the um, Persian Empire, um, once he'd sort of passed through the area of land which is modern day Iran, he started to make himself very Persian. And he threw off a lot of the sort of conventional Greek Macedonian court customs, you know, people approaching him as an equal. He told all of his great commanders to start marrying local Persian women. They started practicing a, 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 something called proskunesis. So you sort of kneel down before Alexander and kiss the floor before his feet. But the thing which really infuriated people was his movement from wearing a dress, of, I mean, it's all Greek clothes, to trousers which were seen as Persian and deeply effeminate. But it's, it's interesting in the history that the real complaints don't seem to be coming, at least in the source material we have, from the uh, Persian courtiers. They're coming from the Greeks, and they're trying to cling on to the cultural purity that surrounded Alexander the Great. Now, I mean, Alexander sort of bringing together this great empire which stretches from the Indus to Egypt as a successor to Persia. It was in this great melting pot of ideas that we have so, so many ideas emerging, particularly religious ideas. It's ultimately from that sort of world of the koine that Christianity and Islam and many facets of Zoroastrianism and many artistic aspects appear. And I, I think it shows that the, the attempt to stand in the way of that, that mixture is the thing that is really problematic. But I, I sort of try to use that as a historical example about the compensation for the past. Now, if one country has attacked another people, then where does compensation lie? It really should lie in, uh, I think as Tiffany touched on, a political, um, a political agreement. So it's to do with land, it's to do with money, it's to do with human rights. It's not to do with using culture as an instrument. And in fact, the real compensation is the propagation of the culture of the people who have been oppressed. Is it really right that we should be keeping culture cloistered and sequestered? That is hardly success of culture, as far as I can see. But to share it, to propagate it, to allow other people to benefit from it, and to watch that culture take new forms 
as the time and the circumstances of place change is the real mark of success of culture. Okay. So, in a sense, that is the compensation for okay, what you thanks. see. Tiff. Yes, to, to follow on from that, using a specific example, which I think is generalizable from of the Native American Museum, it was asked to solve and make apologies for settler society. What it has done is to limit knowledge of Native Americans and their history, because it basically says you cannot explore certain questions unless you're of a certain ethnicity. So it has genuinely restricted knowledge, which I think is a problem. It has also rehabilitated the language of racial purity, which is also a problem. Um, it has presented a museum and culture as the solution to the problems of Native American communities in the present today. So on three counts, I think it is a backward step for those communities, and it basically says, um, I, as a white woman, can't possibly know or understand Native American communities or their culture, and I cannot speak for them or on their behalf. But if we look at human history and where people have made great strides in the achievement of material progress and equality, they have worked together across their ethnicities and genders. And I think uh, this, this discussion about cultural appropriation and asking permission and granting it only to certain people of certain color um, limits that possible solidarity and puts us in our boxes silent on our own. So I think it's really invidious. Um, and it also, I mean, some of the things we're talking about, skirts and food, I mean, this isn't where real politics lies. It's really important to our lived experience, and it's wonderful and interesting. But if we want to achieve change, we can't be talking about trousers. And we are, um, and that is a real problem. It follows on from the last question, really, and I just wonder whether the panel think there is something that is trivialising in the whole discussion by looking at culture. Um, a moment for me was during the Irish conflict where it was clear that things weren't going in the direction of the National Liberation Movement. And they retreated very much into the whole thing about learning Irish. And that, for me, was quite a moment because you thought, there's no coming back from this, really. These people aren't winning. And I think, in one sense, for me, that was quite symbolic of the idea now of where is the conversation? Should it be there? Or should it actually be much more interesting, which is how ideas moved around the globe. And that's really fascinating and really interesting to say who took what, when and how, and why. And um, people, and it's the whole thing about knowledge. So what I uh, wonder about is, so why now? Why has it got so toxic now? Because um, 20 years ago, I, I moved to the States, and the plane I got was a British Airways plane. And one of the choices in great cuisine of, of Great Britain was a chicken tikka masala. And no one banned an eyelid. It was kind of perfectly OK. When I got to the US, the, on the uh, St. Patrick's Day celebrations, you would get a <coughs> bunch of marching bands. And quite a lot of them were black marching bands with shamrocks in their faces. Again, no one complained. And at Cinco de Mayo, the great Mexican festival, again, everyone gets drunk. Everyone pretends to be Mexican for the day. No one complains. So why is it 20 years later it is so toxic? OK, thanks. My question would be who we can call oppressed. Because I think that people who have the ability and time and effort to fire literary editors or engage in a debate whether something should be in a museum or not are people that are not oppressed because they have the ability and the way in which to uh, express themselves in a par excellence elite debate about culture. So my question would be class, which we haven't brought in here, is who are the people that have a kind of um, time and effort and they have the possibility to engage in this debate and why do these people then call themselves the people who represent the oppressed? Okay, very interesting. Claire, I've got the mind. Okay, Pass I've just got a quick along. question which is, is, is it only white people that have the capacity to culturally appropriate? It seems to me there have been a few, one or two things from U European cultures that might have been adopted by sort of other cultures. And I just wondered whether, and obviously that is, doesn't seem to be an issue. So is it only white people that this kind of relates to? I think in theory, like I would agree with you, culture, we can argue it's universal, blah, blah. But I think it's a bit disingenuous to have this debate without thinking about like the dominant power structures that exist. And I don't think the debate is about trousers. I think the debate is like what's behind it. And people are picking bits out of cultures that they like 
um, and not say like supporting the struggle of the people. Like people can wear a headdress um, and it, it's not improving culture because maybe they are basically just racist. So I think we're kind of ignoring like what's behind these debates. People aren't upset because you're wearing the, the just because you're wearing it is because what you, it represents and. But do you think if people wear the headdress, they are racist? No, That's I'm the, not saying that. No, no, no. <laughs> I, no, I, no. I was just clarifying. Sorry, I wasn't. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry. What I mean is, we're taking these things from other cultures that we like, but we're not supporting the struggle of people who are in these okay, cultures, fine. and we're allowing them to just like continue to be oppressed. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. 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 As a child, I grew up with the black and white minstrel show. And I'm sort of half wondering whether the panel would be happy for the black and white minstrel show to still be shown. Uh, I think that's a kind of litmus test, in a way, about cultural appropriation. But for me, culture is never neutral. I think that the point here is that culture is never neutral. Everything is a decision. And I think a lot depends on intention. And I think that's the thing which has been not talked about very much. There's been a lot being talked about appropriating and theft and so on. But very little has been said about the intention of the people who act in certain ways. Uh, and I would just give the example of Nazi uniform. And I think it's possible to wear Nazi uniform in a variety of ways. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, the, it, you could wear a Nazi uniform in all innocence just because you thought you rather liked it, you know, it was rather groovy. Uh, equally, you could be making an extremely and deliberate offensive cultural statement. You could be wait, making a supremacist statement. You could be making a whole range of statements. And so there is never a neutrality here. Uh, there is always that balance between the actor, the person who has an intention with whatever cultural decision they make, and the audience, the person who experiences that. Simple as that. Just on the Nazi question, because you can't get through a session without mentioning them. It is interesting that Germany, during the interwar years, you know, attacked alien Jewish artists and writers for falsely representing German culture, and there was this mm -hmm. idea of cultural purity, so I think that's worth bearing in mind. Um, but just, just something to, uh, also another, another kind of uh, progressive view on this, uh, a declaration, people who wear other styles of dress and live in other styles will become fools to, and, and their nation uh, will come to ruin. Um, and uh, that, that, that certain types of shoes, hairstyles and clothing corrupt, uh, uh, corrupt the people um, and, and should not be allowed uh, um, alien. Anyway, that was the North Korean declaration in 2005. You know, so there is a kind of uh, who owns culture, cultural purity thing that lurks behind this as well, which I think we, uh, we shouldn't at least allow not to get mentioned here uh, uh, because obviously it's easy to see this issue as being progressive and on the side of anti-racism and anti-colonialism, and certainly that's the intentions of those people who are concerned about cultural appropriation. But actually, culturally, the issues around cultural appropriation have got a rather authoritarian and sinister uh, uh, history themselves. Um, so listen, in, in reverse order, just give us your final thoughts. So obviously, uh, Tiff, I'll start with you. Okay. Final thought on this. We've obviously still got a whole festival uh, tomorrow to get through with lots of discussions that reflect back on this. Well, when the black artist Chris Ophelia used elephant dung to paint a picture of the Virgin Mary, he was being offensive and appropriating what animal poo and also the iconography of Western art. And it was a good work. And not all good work is uh, flattering. Uh, some work is very unsettling and offensive, and rightly so. Um, I think the real problem with the discussion around cultural appropriation is twofold. One is it obscures power relations. There's never a real discussion of where power comes from and how it can be challenged. Instead, what it does is it divides people and sets them apart and problematizes the most mundane and human interactions looking around, trying on each other's clothes. It's a wonderful thing, um, and we need to do more of it um, and stop being so stressed out about it and challenge state power. The end. Okay. Uh, Bijan. No, no disrespect to the speakers, but you haven't got time to clap them. Um, right, okay, we'll do it all at the end. Bijan. 
Well, again, I mean, we talk about dominant power structures and the, uh, I mean, the intention behind how you wear the clothes. I mean, unless you stick a big sign on your head saying, I'm wearing this uniform because I am a Nazi, or, or it's innocent, I'm just Prince Harry. Um, <laughs> really, we shouldn't be looking for sort of the settlement of power problems in this field. We should be looking for that settlement in the field of politics, and that's, uh, that's where the division should ultimately lie. So we shouldn't be trying to pick holes in innocent cultural creation just for the sake of making those political points. It is stifling. I would say that culture is actually not innocent in the sense that it is always embedded in part. Somebody's always creating it and somebody, that person may well have a lot of knowledge of the subject that they're doing and that person may not have a lot of knowledge. The reason, one person raised the question, why now? Why is this happening now? Why are we having all these debates? Well, I think it's a lot of it is to do with the fact that um, we have a second or even third generation uh, minorities within this country who have grown up and they feel part of this culture and part of this community, but they don't necessarily see their own um, worldviews or their own themselves represented in a way that they feel is artistically convincing. Um, in the end of the day, as I, as I would always say, it is not really about who creates it or permission. It's about how well you create it. There was a recent program on Channel 4 about um, uh, ISIS called The State, made by uh, Peter Kosminski. There was a review in The Guardian that said, isn't it a pity that... Um, um, you know, it's, it, you know, a white director has to make this program about this. Uh, I thought it was a very odd thing to say, given that the characters who he was uh, looking at were British, and he is also British, um, and also because it was an incredibly thoroughly researched piece of work, which showed an incredible level of um, attention to detail. And in general, he kind of, if your work is good enough, you can do anything. Okay. I think that there is a, a, an issue about universalism which a discussion that we can't really have here today, but it's about how universalism is applied, not just in terms of the Western context, but how universal values also emerge in other parts of the world, and how that's expressed through culture as well. But I don't think, um, as people have indicated, um, you can resolve that discussion within the framework of culture itself. Power relations, as I had indicated uh, at the start, are also underpinned by uh, material concerns. Uh, and we haven't, I think, gone far enough into looking at the, both legal statute and uh, the questions of, uh, of power uh, in, in its pure form. And certainly, um, the question of things like, let's say, Eli Whitney's cotton gin in America, uh, the relationship to slavery and the production of cotton, uh, and who actually invented the cotton gin, those are questions that are up for debate. The, uh, the question of universalism, I think, in terms of the cons its consistent application, also has to, I think, broaden its um, scope. Uh, and that's something that maybe you know, uh, left-wingers and universalists in the audience need to think about, too. OK, thank you very much. And then finally, Sarah. So, yes, hu human history certainly makes great strides when neighbours share cultures, and we've had some really lovely examples here in the room today. But it's not the salvation of culture if the Kardashians start braiding their hair and all the bloggers and magazine writers talk about it as if they're doing this very clever thing and ignore a whole history of amazing creative black hairdressing. Um, so, actually, I want to leave you with the thought that for me, cultural appropriation is not a problem to be solved. It's part of cultural power relations. And it's a thing to be lived with and negotiated daily. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can we thank our brilliant panel? <laughs> <laughs>